Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. I say very special because I have the great honor of sitting down face to face with one of my favorite people in the business. Here's one of my favorite photographs of the two of us together. Uh, Diane and I go back a long time. I've known Diane uh, more years than either one of us have been on this planet. Uh, long before I knew her personally, uh, I knew of her by reputation uh, because she is one of the hardest working and finest actresses in show business at any time uh, in our lives, uh, past, present, and possibly future. Uh, we'll get back to work as soon as we possibly can. Uh, today marks 267 days since our theaters shut down. And as I say, the theaters may be dark, but the ghost lights burn brightly in each and every one of us, and it burns very brightly in Diane Finley. Now, before I bring Diane on, I'm actually gonna leave the screen for a few moments, and I'm gonna share with you a clip from a show that uh, I did, I guess, two years ago. Uh, wow, it's been two years, celebrating Carol Channing's 97th birthday. She was still with us at that time. And I reached out to Diane to be a part of the show. I'm even drinking out of my special mug today. And you can see Diane right there on the mug. So I'm going to share with you, those of you who were at the show know what I'm about to share. And for those of you who were not at the show, you're in for a big treat. Ladies and gentlemen, here's Diane Fenn. Before the rain passes by, I'm gonna go and taste Saturday's highlight. Before the parade passes by, Ever. let me go. It's been long enough, Eva. Every night for all these years, I put out the cat and made myself a little rum toddy. And before I went to bed at night, I would say a prayer thanking God that I was independent, and that nobody else's life was mixed up with mine. And then one night, an oak leaf fell out of my Bible. I placed it there the night you asked me to marry you, Ephraim. It was perfectly good, Oakley, but without life and without color. I suddenly realized that I was like that leaf. For years I have not shed one tear. Nor have I been filled with a wonderful feeling. Something that <coughs> this might turn out well. And so I've decided to rejoin the human race. And Ephraim, I want you to give me the rain. Before the parade passes by, I'm gonna go and taste Saturday's highlights. Before the parade passes by, I'm gonna get some life back into my life. I'm ready to move out in front. I've had enough of just passing by life with the rest of that, with the best of that. I can hold my I'm gonna 
Wow, wow, wow. Can you hear the applause? I am telling you, uh, we have quite an audience already checked in, and you've got relatives from all over the country who are- I do, I yes. do, lucky me. <laughs> Hi, honey. Hi. I am the lucky one. Uh, first of all, um, I want to start, uh, as I you know, said, uh, it, you know, all of our theaters in New York uh, shut down. And of oh. course, you were in production. Uh, you were going to be opening Sister Act. Yes, uh, in Paper Mill. At the Paper Mill Playhouse. And I want to ask you, um, and be honest with us, how are you doing really in the midst of this crazy time we find ourselves in? I'm doing okay, and I'll, I'll I'll explain what that means. I think it, it, it you know it comes in levels, right? I mean, it's been a long, long time. In the beginning, it was just I was terribly disappointed, of course, about Sister Act, and we were also going to be taking it to Korea, which would have been phenomenal. Wow. Yeah, it would have been a phenomenal experience. For that to get shot down was tough, and nobody ever really realized what was going on. You know that. Um, so. I, I took it easily. I, I It was the spring and the summer and I went on Amazon and bought myself two beach chairs and I would go down to the park because I live near Riverside Park and I would invite mm -hmm. friends. And it was an outdoor existence, which certainly helped a lot of us because mm -hmm. uh, there was still communication. There was outdoor restaurants. And although our world, our world of performers had died a horrible death, mm -hmm. um, I became familiar with Zoom, which was an absolute challenge because it's not my thing. And I've taken three exercises classes a week. I have cocktail parties on Friday night, so I can't stay with you long. I have a cocktail party. To go to. <laughs> I can't um, for an hour. Right, oh, okay, that's fine. That's um, I have. Um, I just, now that the winter's coming, I, I've dusted off my sign language book. I want to get into that. I want to do, I want to do, learn Italian. I've been knitting. I've been doing crossword puzzles. I talk to family and friends because I think it's extremely important to reach out, spread a little joy, which I, I thoroughly enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. I have been fortunate enough to do a reading of two new musicals, which has been wonderful. Uh, I've also, I did a film, Richard. I got a phone call not too long ago from Northern Stage. I worked there last year. I did a wonderful world premiere play called Venus Rising. And the same playwright wrote a play, uh, which was for COVID. It's uh, four mm -hmm. monologues, but Equity didn't okay it. So they decided to turn it into a film. So I have just come off a real, real high thank you, dear God, because I know I'm one of the few that did get a phone call to do a wonderful, wonderful monologue. And my name was Goosey. Isn't that the cutest damn thing you've ever heard? <laughs> Hi, I'm Goosey. Um, and we filmed it in the park and it was a, a phenomenal experience. I think probably one of the best experiences I've ever had as far as creating something. Uh, oh, I, love wow. I love the playwright. She, she hears me, I hear her. Um, I hope we bring it around again. It got 
well received and now she's thinking about turning it into a full-fledged play hopefully mm -hmm. which would be a a wonderful thing because it deserves it um it's a human conditions uh, for great monologues and the one other thing that i have been doing is i've been very very involved with the rehearsal club do you know them richard well it's very funny that you mentioned the rehearsal club um, because I am going to be doing a special presentation uh, for the rehearsal club. Okay. Uh, plug, I'll give it right now on January 12th. So you can tell everyone else a little bit about it as a plug for to come back in January and be a part of that. Oh, I'm very, very happy. I'm very excited about this. Now, I'm not going to get this information totally right because I never get anything totally right. No, well, I'll fill in the blank. But that's okay because... What's happened is the rehearsal club was a place that young aspiring actors would live. Uh, with the dead mother, or safe, safe, a safety haven. Mm -hmm. And that, I don't remember when, I mean, people like Carol Burnett, you know, there are many, many people that are part of that organization and part of that process of coming into the city for the first time, which was um, very frightening. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. become affiliated with a wonderful place called the Webster Apartments, which mm -hmm. is like the rehearsal club, but one million times even. It's, it's on 34th Street. Street. I believe Mr. Macy donated that building. Now, again, that might be misinformation, but it sounds good. Um, what the rehearsal club is trying to do, it, it the rehearsal club is filled with alumni, women, and they're all become very powerful women, people who care to give back, to give forward, and boy, is there ever a time to do that? It's now. Um, our goal is to subsidize young people coming in from all over the world. Please, dear God, when that can happen again. <laughs> yeah. Our dream is to own a whole hall of individual rooms to subsidize for these children. Our goal is $100,000. We, Carol Burnett just donated $20,000, so we have a room, which is great. And um, as I said, our goal is $100,000. We do have an anonymous donor whom we, I, I don't know, but this anonymous donor is matching everything that is coming in. It, this is taking off like, well, it's just meant to be. That's what that's all about. So I have a little website I'd like to give you. So if you're anyone out there is feeling gracious, a little more gracious this Christmas, we can always use your help. Um, it's www.rehearsalclubnyc.com. Come help us. It's a, it's a really good cause. It's it's exciting. It's thrilling. Thank you. I'm sorry. Say it again. What is that again? Oh, www rehearsalclubnyc.com. I do, I do, www.rehearsalclubnyc.com. And there it is on your screen, everyone. Oh, thank you. That's so kind. Well, oh, I really yeah. know, Diane, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So if any of your other devices are on a phone or anything else, no. uh, it will cause a little uh, bit of a feedback here. Yeah, no, I have nothing. But you're doing you're doing great. Probably just not very sophisticated hardware. Well, we're all learning as we go along. And, you know, and it sounds like, you know, it's very interesting because artists uh, are by our very nature, uh, very resilient. And you obviously uh, have embraced so much over the last few months. Uh, but what has been the one thing that you've had the most resistance to uh, during the last nine, 10 months? For me, my life is about people, Richard. It's about people. I uh, thrive on entertaining. Mm -hmm. I thrive on having people interactions. And that's been very, very difficult for me. My home, I don't want to say is lonely. It's It can be empty. And that emptiness can mm -hmm. be very, very difficult for all of us. And also, I think every day, don't you go through a myriad of emotions every day? You know, I every say, hour. Oh, oh, it's not for the week. I mean, right, right. It's not for the week, I'll tell you that. But my philosophy has always been keep that cup at least half full. But that's what's been the hardest for me, the interaction of, of, of being with people in a room. You know, I'm always on the phone, as I said. I'm always doing that. But 
touch, a hug, mm -hmm. you know, seeing someone's full face, the realization that this could be, we, we don't even, we don't even know. And the devastation of what I see in my city, my Upper West Side, my beautiful Upper West Side, how people are trying so hard with these outdoor restaurants and are they going to survive and uh, restaurants for 50 years and say to me, we can't do it. It's just, it's, just, it, it, it's to me, it is inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be months, months, and months. So we got to all stick together. Call me. Everybody call me. I'm here. I'll sing. I'll do anything you want. Well, you know, I have a uh, philosophy uh, that uh, I want to put out there. I yeah. think that everybody, uh, regardless of what your political affiliations are or anything, um, I think we should all hibernate for January and February. And then we should all come out and start celebrating again in March. I think you mean for that, safety to really keep it I safe. Think for safety, I think you know. I will tell you, and you know this better than anybody. I'm a people person too. Yeah, you are. You certainly um, are. And this will be the first year uh, in 30 years that I've not had a holiday party. Oh. Um, and I will have as many as 125 people. In yeah, my I know. Party. I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I do too. I'm a Christmas Eve person. I have 14, 15. I'm miserable. It's And it's not just me and what I do. It's the fact that all of the people that throw parties that are part of our traditions yeah. are no longer there this year. No. I do believe that for the safety of this country and the world, that we need to just hunker down like the bears do. And then come out and hopefully dance in the streets. Yeah. With, you know. Uh, well, it's not going to happen. It's just unfortunately not going to happen. Uh, I would be very happy to follow right behind you. And everybody I personally know would do that. I must say the Upper West Side is, is really quite good. I mean, better than good. They uh, they adhere to all the rules. I'm very, very proud of this community. I see where others aren't so good. But uh, mm -hmm. yes, Richard, that would be the ideal thing. That would be... Well, that's the obvious. Right. It would be the obvious thing. Now, I want to go a little back with you. Okay. Um, you mentioned the rehearsal club. I know I live in Rockland County, and you were born in Rockland County. I was. Um, I was born in Suffern, New York. But when did you first? Um, well, when did you first venture? into Manhattan to pursue a career as an actress? I was 18 and I came in to take singing lessons. And that's when I first came, I don't even know. You know, I don't even know. I, I know I came out singing and dancing. I mean, that, that there was no other, nothing else I wanted to do. There is still nothing else I really want to do. I love us. Um, so I was 18, um, maybe 17 on my first, so I'm not going to tell you the dates. I'm old enough. I don't have to admit to it. You and I are the same age whether you want to be or not. What, honey? I said you and I are the same age whether you want to be or not. Are you that old? <laughs> <laughs> now you're giving away my secrets. I was going to say you're that young. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, that's right. But um, I, I really came in when I was 20, 21 years old for an audition for Hello, Dolly, that I was not supposed to do because I was engaged to be married. And now, I'm I'm not going further. I'm going to interrupt yeah. you for a moment. Please. I'm reading a great book called My Beautiful Detour and about the detours that happen in our lives. And I want to go back to that moment because I know the story and I want you to share this with everyone. Um, on a pivotal moment in your life, uh, we may not have known the Diane Finley that we know. No, it all happened around a block. Mm -hmm. I uh, had my wedding gown. I had my place. I had my future husband, who, by the way, was a very wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. um, but I forgot to tell my agent that I was giving up show business because he didn't want me in show business. He just couldn't deal with that. And I think back then I can, you know, certainly not the way it is now. It's, it's, normal for two people to have their separate careers and still be together and extremely healthy. So I went in for that audition and I said a prayer. I said, dear God, okay, here's the deal. If I don't get this job, I'll be barefoot and pregnant. That's cool. I'll get it. But if I get this job, we're going to have to have a talk. So I went in and I, I auditioned and I did not get it. 
So on my way back to the Port of Authority, um, I hear George Martin. Isn't it funny how you remember names? Mm -hmm. George Martin was the um, stage manager. And um, he said, come on back to the theater, please. It was an immediate hire. Uh, rehearsals would have begun, began the following week. And the young lady that they chose was not available. It became mine. So I went home and sat down with my mother and father and cried my heart out because I did a naughty, you know, I was dishonest. My father wanted to be a professional and he should have been. So when I explained what happened, they said, well, let's get your fiance over here and we'll talk to him. So my fiance came over, daddy popped a bottle of champagne and told Peter what had happened. And I explained and my, my fiance said, no, that's not what I want. And my father said, well, then dear son, there's the door. Wow. And that was it. That was it. That was it. I shouldn't have had that. Well, I should have. There's no mistakes in life. You know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that was the beginning of my career. Wow. And, you know, Diane, you have been very, very fortunate that you've had this through line happening throughout your career. And just mentioning your name, uh, has anybody in this business ever disliked you? Oh, what an awful question. I, you know, oh, I yeah. asked that question because Carol Channing once said to me, for every person who likes you, there are an equal number who don't. And I have yet to hear one person ever say a negative thing about you. And wow. I say that as a positive. Wow. I, I, I don't know, Richard. I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I, I try to give everything I've got because that's what I how I was raised. I have a happy heart. I'd like to share. And if there is anybody out there that doesn't care for me, I apologize. But if those are people out there that love me, I love you back and thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> no, I say that I love you back for you because I mean, all the times that I have sat in the audience, even before I knew you personally, uh -huh. um, you have always delivered the goods. Uh, you uh, have a reputation that far precedes you in terms of working. And a lot of people who may be watching this, who want to go into this business, mm -hmm. uh, no one is an island. And you can explain better than anyone that it is always a collaborative affair. Well, oh, it's hard. It's the hardest, I think one of the hardest businesses in the world. One day you're up, next day you're down. I believe that might be a lyric. <laughs> yes, but it is. It, it's true. You know, it's true. It's it's a it's a fight constantly, a constant fight, and a constant reaffirming yourself. You have to stay vocalized all the time. I stay ready. I stay ready. You've got to keep out there. You, you know, when I was a young girl, I never thought of show business as show business. I didn't realize it. Oh, if I had known then what I know now, I would have I would have done it differently. I would have treated it more of a business. So I teach everybody that now. You've got to stay in touch. You have to be represented by the right people and you have to have people that keep you right out there constantly. Now, now I want to go back to your childhood. Um and you know your parents obviously uh and you were lucky to have understanding parents. Yes. Uh, but did you grow up in a household where you were exposed to the arts? Uh, not professional arts, but my mother was one of 10 children, a big Italian family, and everybody sang, <laughs> everybody hmm. played an instrument, everybody cooked, and everybody was funny. My family were very funny people. They had comedic senses about them. They're always dressing up and doing this. I, I came from a great deal of laughter. So it was all very natural to me. And what was the defining moment for you when you decided that you wanted to pursue this as a career? When I was three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and I, no, I'm not serious. At Suffered, New York, uh, the Lafayette Theater, Miss June Casson's dance studio. They put me a little bra on the little bottom and they taught me how to shimmy. And I did, have you ever passed a quarter of fourth and grand wear a little ball of rhythm? How does you shine stand? That was it. That was it. Got the applause, and I've never forgotten it, and I never stopped, and I never will. <laughs> so when you made the decision that you were going to be going to Dolly, uh, that opportunity, uh, it, I believe it was God uh, touching you oh, uh, with it was. Your, saying you're going to go into this business. Yeah. Um, how long did it take you, or did it happen instantly, where you said, I, make, I made the right decision? 
Oh, the minute my fiance walked out the door. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't have said that. No, no, no. no. Oh, oh, the thrill of that. I still have a lot of friends that were in that show. I was with Carol, Carol, and then she left, and I did it with Ginger Rogers. I didn't stay very long. I uh, That was, you know, like you look back on where could you have changed? Where could you have made a better decision? I don't know if it could have been a better decision, but I, I left after several months because I was given the opportunity to go to Vietnam. And I remember watching Ethel, um, Martha Ray and all those World War II movies. And I always wanted to do that. And I got to go in 1966, there I go again with dates, to, to honor and to be with the boys over in Vietnam for 19 days. And I went with Georgie Jessel, who was the Toastmaster General of the United States. And a rather, a, a rather famous comedian, and an accordion player, and we hit all the front lines for 19 days. So, although I probably shouldn't have given up Hello Dolly because it was such a gift, mm -hmm. there was nothing like my gift to go to Vietnam, bar none. Makes me cry. Mm. Wow, 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 wow. And yeah. You know, and, and coming back, uh, when I came to New York, um, yeah. it was through backstage and that we found out about auditions. Uh, was it the same process for you when you were, how did you find out about the auditions that were out there? I had an agent immediately, lucky me. And also, um, yes, the magazine backstage, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. It yeah. was our yeah. Bible, wasn't it? It was our Bible. I don't think there was anything. Well, again, I was very, very lucky. I, I, I don't even know how I got her. I don't remember that. I don't remember that. You know, back then things went in from one to another to another for me. I was lucky. It was also a time of industrial shows, mm -hmm. live industrial shows. And uh, I think Hal Linden and I did one of my first Buick industrial shows together. Isn't that amazing? And so I did hundreds of industrial shows. I don't remember, Richard, but I was lucky. I got an agent right away. And with anything, Go ahead. And I don't know why I'm getting this horrible feedback here, and I've adjusted everything mm -hmm. on the computer to figure out, so I apologize for that. But when you first, what was one of the biggest bumps that you've had in this business? Because I know that with conversations that you and I have had over the years, um, and same way a show closes and that dread of will I ever work again comes over us. It's just something that's ingrained in all of us. Um, but what was the biggest, first of all, the biggest lapse of time in your career? Because I've never known you to be out of work for any long periods of time. But what was the longest lull that you've had in your career? And what was the biggest bump or hurdle that you've had to get over? In your career. Oh, no, that one I'm not quite sure about, but I, I do remember when I came back from Las Vegas, I was out in Las Vegas opening the MGM Grand Hotel, which was one of the first big hotels. We did the spectacular Hallelujah Hollywood. I was only going to go out there for six months, but it wasn't built in six months. So I ended up staying for maybe two years. Um, big mistake. If you want New York, you stay in New York. And in fact, I left. Oh, you know, here it is. Here it is in a nutshell. I don't even like to talk about it, but I am. Okay. I was doing uh, Drew Barry Was a Lady at ELT a hundred years ago, right? And my leading man was a, a very nice man. His name was Danny DeVito. Mm -hmm. And I was offered Richard Rogers two by two, and I was offered David Merrick's um, 110 in the shade from that production. I got, I'll never forget waking up the following morning and people saying, Oh my God, you read the daily news, but you, I got reviews that, well, and they were, I, I didn't know what they were talking about. It was so thrilling. I was in the middle of a, a, of a very lousy relationship which I'm prone to do. <laughs> and um, instead of staying and making that decision, I ran away. I went to Las Vegas. 
I went to Las Vegas. And who, remember earlier in this conversation, I said, I wish I had thought of show business as show business. Mm -hmm. That was a big, big mistake. Did I have a wonderful time in Las Vegas? Yes. I won the Female Performer of the Year Award in Las Vegas. Yes. Everything is wonderful as long as you dive into it and get into what you're doing. But it wasn't a smart move for my career. And it took by the time I got back. Here's your other question. I I think it was at least a year because when I came back, there was this thing called casting directors. Exactly. But I didn't have Hmm? Why do you think that was not the right decision? Because I had everything right there in the palm of my hand. Everybody wanted me. I wanted Broadway. It's the only thing I ever wanted. Now, not to imply I don't love my Lord Theaters and, and Cabaret and everything I, we've, we all do. It's all wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But that, I mean, I, I still have my acceptance speech. You know, I do it in, in everything. But you, you can't. If you want New York, you stay in New York. Remember we were saying that? You have to keep every day, every day. Two years away was two years away. You don't turn down David Merrick and Richard Rogers. It was it was a boo-boo. It was a big boo-boo. I don't usually talk about these things. Well, I, okay, it's life. I have a commercial break, and then we're going to get back on track. And the commercial break is from Denise Lawrence. And she says, Richard, can you please uh, let my Aunt Diane know that Joy Scott's daughter is here and <laughs> I miss and love her. And I wish I could give her a big hug from me and my mom. Oh, honey, I love you too with all my heart. My house for cocktails once this is all over. <laughs> I'm going to be there too. Yeah, you are. Um, I love being at your house for cocktails. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about some of the roles that you've done over the years. Mm -hmm. what, you know, and again, we it, this is all about celebrating you. Thank but you. Was there any particular role that somehow got away, but there was something better waiting in the wings for you? Um, there are two shows that I, I've never been offered, which... I could never quite understand why, but we're always the last to know, right? Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to do cabaret for Elaine Schneider. That never happened for me. And I always, because I love Canberra and I, I always wanted to do Gypsy. And that never happened for me. Um, I am a true Jerry Herman girl. Mm -hmm. I have seen every one of Jerry Herman's shows over and over and over again. And if they'd let me, I would still do them over and over again. I did get to do Dear World with Sally Ann Howes and Georgia Engels, uh, and Jerry was there. We did it up at- um, Good speed. Uh, yeah, at a good speed. And to work with Jerry Herman, I, I, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't breathe. I was so excited. But am I answering your question properly? You're, you're answering my uh, questions perfectly. Now, I want to ask you, I mean, you have done, how many productions of MAME have you done? Speaking oh, many. Of Carol time. Lawrence with, 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 what's that wonderful, oh, names, names, names. Um, never mind, can't think. But a lot of stars, I've done it with stars. I have done both Vera and MAME over and over and over again. I, I think my last was with Carol Lawrence. Which I saw. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll talk about that sometime other time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was she was so very good to me. And then I saw you at the Paper Mill Playhouse in a phenomenal production oh, uh, of Funny Girl, okay. uh, where you played Mrs. Bryce. And uh, Leslie Kritzer was a phenomenal uh, Fanny Bryce. Uh, can you talk about that production? For it was wonderful. <clears throat> wow, I remember that audition so well. What a treat that was. Bobby O'Hanson, by the way, did a brilliant job on that show. Yes. Our director. And Leslie, nobody knew. Leslie didn't know who Leslie was. I'll never forget Robert coming into us one day and saying, I want you all just to trust me. I'm bringing in a young girl and she's really raw and really new, but I believe in this girl. Need I say any more, Richard? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was brilliant and that was a wonderful production and it should have come across the river, but there was political things going on and it didn't. That was one of my heartbreaks. That was a great role for me. It was. No, I don't no, know. But it, that yeah. nice. Yes, it did. It shouldn't have because I understand that was brilliant too. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not on that side of the table, so I don't mm -hmm. understand it. But too bad. 
And I wanna, you know, and again, I talked earlier about your, you know, coming to New York. You knew when you were three that you wanted to pursue this as a career. Um, I am a very big proponent of arts and education. And I just want to know what your exposure to the arts was when you were in school. We did plays. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. I, I did some plays. Uh, I did Carousel and A Love of Three Oranges. Oh, yeah. We had an orchestra. And we had teachers. In fact, one of my teachers came to see me in Las Vegas and reminded me of many things. So it was very much happening. Not like it is now. I think the schools oh, are no. rather sophisticated. It's phenomenal. But it was there. And who are some of the mentors <laughs> of this business that have helped to shape the Diane Finley that we know in this business? Oh, wow. Bill Esper, people I've worked with in coaching, uh, a lot of my singing teachers. Um, I never schooled. Uh, mm -hmm. I never really went to school. I studied with all individual people along the way. And I learned from the people I worked with, you know, the great people, the great stars that I worked with, take a little from here, a little from there and put it in a melting pot. And here's Diane Finley. And life, life's greatest teacher in the world, if you listen. Well, speaking of melting pot, I want to talk about one of your uh, very successful roles, and that was the musical version of Tales of the City. I, I was hoping you were going to bring that up. Yes. Oh, my God. What can I say? It started out so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I never forget being in my living room. I had a friend here, and I said, I have to learn this song for an audition next week, but I don't think I can do it because it's the filthiest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> It is. I have the the occasion, and 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 I have sung the filthiest song ever to be sung on on the, on the stage. It was brilliant. It was fabulous. Um, I got to work with someone that I have looked up to my entire life, and will to the day I die. Judy K. Oh, God. yes. I got to play Judy K.'s mother. And it was you know that her mom yeah. is, I think, 106 years old yeah. now. And Judy is out in Colorado taking care of her mom. Yeah, so, Judy, if you see this, Diane and I both love you. Oh, Judy, with all my heart. Those were good times, weren't they, honey? <laughs> yeah, it was wonderful. We wanted to bring that in. We wanted so much to bring that in. Judy was always so cute to me. She said, you know, Diane... We bring this in. That's your Tony. It was one of those great roles. It was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who's to explain why you stop a show? Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't know why. I, well, I, 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 it was Mother Mucka. I played Mother Mucka, and that people loved Mother Mucka. And I'm telling you, I had this song that every night the show would stop, and I would just stand there and we'll pray because I'm always talking to God anyway. It was just wonderful. It was a uh, the same thing happened. We did it in New York. I don't think you were there. We uh, Two years ago, Betsy Wolf put together a um, concert version. We did it at uh, the Music Box. Um, the dad came in. It was wonderful. I, uh, the character, my character, stopped the show again. I couldn't believe it. I guess I still think there's a tiny bit of humility here. Thank you, God. But um, what a feeling that is. And one, I mean, first of all, it's a beloved book. It's a beloved uh, t series. Why? I mean, and again, nobody knows. I do. I do know. And that's because you just said the right thing. It was a series. And here was the problem. What story do you tell? Mm -hmm. You see, and they didn't know how to do that. They didn't know how to bring it all in. I mean, that was a series that went on and on and on. They couldn't figure it out. Oh, how they tried. I mean, that was, a, that was a gay liberation time. It was, San Francisco was hopping. It was a perfect Me. show to bring in. And I, 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 I want to play a little game with you. Uh -oh. um, I'm going to ask a few questions. Uh, because you've had such a great career, it's hard to really hone in on one aspect of it. But I want to ask you, what was the one script that you got the script and you said, oh, my God, this is 
this is not a good script. It's not good. It's and then the show opens and surprise, it's a huge hit. I don't know if I have an answer for that. Mm -hmm. Next answer. Next question. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think I. 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 I'm sure. Now you've already no, mentioned earlier. You mentioned Vegas earlier, and you the fact that you were away for two years and these things. What are some of the other choices that you've made that were, as I referred to earlier, these detours in the road or these bumps in the road that send you down a completely different path? The same thing. Same, same thing as Las Vegas. I, I did a lot of industrial shows. Now, I worked with the best. I traveled the world. Uh, who gets to sing about a backhoe loader bounce? I mean, you know, <laughs> which I did. That was uh, another big mistake. Um, not the joy, not the experience, not the traveling, not the people. All of that was wonderful. Again, you can't be away and then come back and expect to be right in that groove again. And also, I think industrial shows, you become a different kind of performer. You become very uh, slick, slick. I remember my first couple of auditions, my agent calling me and saying, we got to work on it. We got to get you back to acting class because I'm getting the word slick about you and that's not going to work. It was perfect for industrial shows, but <laughs> there wasn't the heart. How but say that your career mapped out by you, and how much of it has been? Wait, you have to start that again because you bleeped out, honey. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a. I don't know why we're having these technical issues. I, I think it's because I just don't have good equipment. I'm going to have to splurge and buy a Mac. Uh, well, uh, are you on Google Chrome with this or? Yeah, I am. Oh, sure. Um, but how much of your career would you say has been mapped out? And how much do you feel is just uh, circumstances of roles in situations that have come your way? I don't think anything was ever mapped out for me. Uh, there again, I wish I had thought of show business as show business. There, I'm keep going back to that, but I have to go back to that. No, I just rolled along. Just rolled along. Again, had great agents along the way. Uh, met the right people along the way. And um that's how my career has been and still seems to be. Oh, oh I'm still. But obviously, but obviously, there was a point in your career where everything turned around and you began to look at it as a business. You have to. Oh, yeah, as a much older woman, oh, of course. So, what was the turning point for you? And had you been in the business for quite a while? When I got back from Las Vegas, when I got back from Las Vegas, I thought, oh, wait a minute. I want this. I want this world and it doesn't want me right now. This is not a good thing. So, um, <laughs> now the last time that I saw you on stage in a um a musical uh -huh. uh, was when you uh did the full Monty. Uh, uh -huh. and you were so delicious in that role. Um and no folks, we did not see the full Monty of uh Diane Fenley. No, but I saw him of everybody else. <laughs> Uh, tell us about that production because it was a perfect cast. Which was which? What production was that? The production that I uh, that we went with Ed Kurtzman, our mutual oh, friend. Oh, at that sweet oh, little uh, Engelman Theater. That's a great little theater, by the way. Little theater out Long Island, and it's just run by such lovely, lovely people, and they do really good good productions. Um, you now, can Dan, uh, uh, Dan Newberger yeah. uh, says that. Um, your the turning point was when you started listening to her. <laughs> oh, I have a quick story. I have to, hi, Jan. I can always trust you, honey. <laughs> Here's my funny story about Jan Newberger. Jan and her hubby used to live in uh, Newtown, and Jan was <laughs> Jan was in Wicked. So Jan would spend uh, nights with me for matinee days. Jan and I are very different, but she's like my sister, and I worship the ground she walks on. One day, I don't remember where we were, and so we were talking to someone, and that someone said, Jim, what is it like to wake up in the morning with Diane Finley over coffee? And Jim Newberger <laughs> said, well, if you don't mind listening to Ethel Merman sing There's No Business Like Show Business, I guess it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, baby? Isn't that what you said? That wasn't nice. <laughs> and she says, I love you, ditto. Um, so... Uh, do you like being on the road as an actress? Not anymore. 
not anymore. My 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 last biggie. And I would have loved to go Korea. That's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. My last biggie was Sister Act. We did the national tour, and it was great for the first year because they were sit downs. But oh boy, when you start going from week to week and you fly on your day off and you're exhausted. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm over that. As she says, and the phone will ring tomorrow, right? But I mean, I think I would do it if they were sit downs, month here, month there, but it'd have to be a role I really would want to play. Now, Jan, the only woman I know who puts Ethel on the box first thing in the morning. What? Uh, Jan Newberger says, you're the only woman I know who puts Ethel on the box first thing in the morning. I guess she means a record or an album. Well, she means Ethel Merman. If you don't mind listening to Ethel Merman sing, there's no business like show business in the morning. It's great to live with Diane. Now, no, has no Diane, you've been very, very supportive because you have a very supportive family, obviously. Um, yeah. But how do you... Uh, compartmentalize this aspect of your life. Obviously, you have a very successful uh, performing career, but you also have a very strong family life. Uh, I how, do. How do you integrate the two and how do you separate the two? Well, I don't separate the two. In fact, I'm being drawn into the two. I have two nieces that are extremely gifted. Mm -hmm. Really, really gifted. One has been working with the Rockettes for many years, and wow. kind of, yeah, well, not. I'm sorry, uh, g going to their camps or summer camps. She's, okay. she's too young, uh, but oh my god, she's a brilliant dancer. She could do Broadway tomorrow if she wanted to, but she doesn't. She wants to be a physical therapist. But she would come in every summer and and live with me while she was in rehearsal, and that was such a gift. And my other niece also does want Broadway. She did say to me not too long ago, you know, Aunt Diane, I will be on that Broadway stage. And and I she said, yeah, she will. She will. She so will. I, keep it, I keep it very much together. And I, I, I talk to my niece all the time on the phone. I try to keep a connection, especially now because we can't be with one another. But why should it be different? It's the same thing. I'm the same person. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And my, oh. friend, my friends are very important to me. I, 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 I covet my friends. Um, I learned a long time ago that friendship doesn't just happen. You have to nurture that. Amen. You, know, you really do. You have to. You have to warrant being someone's friend. And I take pride in that. I take pride. I don't know if I was like that when I was young. I doubt it. I'm sure I was young and selfish, like most people. But I, 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 I take pride in that. Now, I want to talk about another role that I saw you do, and this was a few years ago, in which you played Lucille Ball. Ah, um, I loved what Lucille. What was that experience like for you, playing a person that was so iconic, yeah. and everybody knows because she's been in our houses uh, yeah. all our lives? Yeah, that wasn't so easy for me because of that main reason, because she was so special, so unique. But I did buy all of her works, and I day after day I sat and watched and watched and watched and watched and watched. And Lee Cannon certainly helped me a great deal, uh, her nephew and writer of I Loved a Lucy. So it turned out to be a good experience. I wish that had gone further too, but it didn't. But uh, getting to know Lucille Ball, uh, Jim Brochu is a good friend of uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Apparently he played get black backgammon with her a lot. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was a good experience. I had to work at it, you know. I don't think those things are easy to do. And with I mean, how do you right now pursue the, the projects that you're going to take on? Uh I mean, if you got a phone call tomorrow. Uh, and let's say that there is no pandemic and that you're able to go on the road, I'm assuming that you would go. I'd do anything now. I'm desperate, desperate to sing. And I don't mean that in a silly way, but I mean, you know, we're all starving to death, right? We're starving to death creatively. Yes. Oh, to be in rehearsal for um, the play that, uh, our, did we talk about my film I just finished? Yeah, I did. You mentioned it, yeah. Yeah, it was called The Naked Librarian. And it was so wonderful to be sitting here in Zoom rehearsals, which is really bizarre, but that's okay because it was monologue. And, um, oh, to get a hold of a monologue, it was a, almost a 15 minute monologue. And I thought I'm never gonna be able to do this. But 
it was like the gift from heaven being able to sit down and and just to have that to have that to be able to memorize and it was so much me in that monologue that it was kind of easy uh, nothing's easy but I had a lot to draw from but just the feeling of being a part of what we do again was just fantastic and of course based on speculation um this feedback is horrendous <laughs> I know I'm so um, sorry you know, hey um but uh nobody knows uh this is only speculation but how do you think or how do you feel that theater is going to come back? I don't know, Richard. I, I The thought of that, because it's all about numbers, Richard. It's all about a lot of people, stadiums, uh, symphonies, uh, concerts, Broadway th theaters, 500, 800 thousands of people. I don't know. I, I, it's not. We're not going to wake up one day and say, put your makeup on. I wish we could. It's going to take a long time. And I think we're going to have to, as we all know, start out slowly with two people plays, four people plays. It's going to be a long, long time. And with everything you've done, what is the one thing that you haven't done that you really uh, want to get done before uh, your number is called, so to speak? Cabaret. Cabaret, I've been putting it off. And every time I do your show, and I I, I think at my age, I have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would like to possibly put together a nightclub act again. I know that's not about making money. I know it's about spending money. Well, let's, have to, have to, have to, have to, let's talk about that for a moment. Because you and I have talked about this for years. I know, I know. It's my yeah. own fault. And I mean, uh, and let's face it, um, most people, the paradigm for those of you who don't know, uh, here in New York, um, and I feel that uh, the New York City cabaret world has shot itself in the foot um, tremendously because we've created a business that you don't make money at, and it's virtually impossible, excluding that aspect of it. What is the aversion for you to but you know, batten down the hatches and do that one woman show that we're all desperately waiting for. Because I like that contact with people. I like that one on one in, in, in a cabaret situation. I think one of my favorite little rooms is what's the one on Second Avenue? Uh, Beach Club? The Beach. Oh, I don't know. There's something about that room that just fascinates me to be in that curve of that wonderful baby grand piano and just be able to stare right down at somebody it thrills me to no end. I, I like that. Like well, there's so many people, and I know myself included, that are just waiting for that night when we're all going to be sitting there in that darkened space with just you and a piano and any other musicians that you uh, yeah. choose to have with you. I just don't know how, how you even get started. I mean, first of all, you know, you say to yourself, you start telling about your life and you think, well, I'm not very exciting. You, you got to find that handle, you know, you, you got to find that handle. I think maybe this is the time I should talk to people I know, because I know an awful lot of people, as you know. I know the best in the business. And maybe I should say, it's time for a chat. Let's talk. Let's let's find out where I where that mm -hmm. happens. Because I love to write. I'm, I actually am a pretty good writer. It's just that I'm not a good conceiver. I, it's it's hard for me to, con to, to, to conceive. Once I've got that, then I can... Collaborate. Anyway. And have you ever taught or have you ever thought about teaching? Yes, I have. And I might start doing that for, for the rehearsal club. They have asked me to, uh, being affiliated now with the Webster House, because we have meditation going and they've asked me. And I, and I think I'm going to start doing that, Richard. I would enjoy that. I just don't know quite how to do that on Zoom. I know a friend of mine is uh, teaching on Zoom quite successfully. And I'm going to plug into her next week and see how she does it. But wouldn't that be fun? Oh, I watched wow. Steve Ross. I watched his class, and I watched. Um, uh, oh, who's that? Oh, uh, Marilyn May. Marilyn May. Oh my God, Marilyn May. Went to her class one day. She took one look at me, and she said, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I have come to steal everything you've got." Well, you know, uh, in about five minutes, uh, somebody is going to be waiting. For with you uh, for a cocktail. 
Um, so I want to thank you for doing this. I hope you've enjoyed doing this today as much as I did. Oh, it was so I, wonderful. Time is gone. I just love, love, love you. I can't say enough about how much I love you. Well, I um, love you too. I love you too. And thank you with all my heart. It's been so much fun. And thank you everyone for, for, for plugging in. I know my background is bad. I know the color is bad. I know I have to upgrade, love you. but I don't care. I'm here and I love You're all here. of you. I want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Um, if you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did, uh, excluding the feedback issues that we had, please go to my website, richardskipper.com, sign my guest book with your thoughts about the show. I also want to let everyone know, if you are around, uh, that tomorrow afternoon at 5 o'clock, I am going to be sitting down and having a wonderful hour with Catherine Cat Kramer. Her father is Stanley Kramer, and wow. she has taken the mantle, and she does films and projects uh, with meaningful subjects that we need to tackle and talk about. So I'm very excited about sitting with her tomorrow afternoon. Mm -hmm. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list, pull up the fourth name that pops up, and reach out to that person, not with a text or an email uh, or a private message, but with a phone call and let them know what they mean in your life. Because as Diane said earlier, it's very, very important that we keep the communication and that personal touch flowing. That cannot be taken away from all of us. We have to do this. Yes. Now, before we end the show, I'm gonna give you the final word. Anything you want to expound upon that we talked about today? Um, anything you want to talk about that we didn't talk about that you wish we had? Or just any message that you want to put out to everyone who's watching now? And and you, you touched upon just about everything I ever would have wanted to talk about. And I, all I want to say is hang in there. Hang in there, everybody. Don't let go. Just don't let go. The winter is going to be hard. It's going to... We're going to feel a little more isolated. I'm concerned about the no outside dining. I'm just concerned. So find yourself projects. Be kind to yourself. Be good to yourself. And don't let go because we got to get out of this. And we got to get back to our real world and our real lives. And I love you all. And bye. Well, I have a big cocktail party for all of you when this is over. Happy holidays. Oh, what's your cocktail of choice What? What's your cocktail of choice today? Oh, I'm going to have a glass of wine very soon. Sounds great. I love you. <laughs> I love you, Richard. I love you all. God bless. Thank you. Good night. Bye, honey.